Welcome to Threshing Floor Bible Study, taught by Bible teacher Dr. Walter Bramson, separating the truth of God's Word from the traditions of men. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Son of God. Praise the Lamb who took away our sins and died for us. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Joshua 6. And a short review from last two weeks. The city and all that was in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute and the Presbyterian, are all who are with it and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are to be sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. They devoted the city to the Lord and they destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. Chapter 7. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Tzerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you, Father, that you gave us salvation, that you gave us free will to choose you for eternity. But knowing that we would use our free will to sin against you, you also sent us a Savior, your Son, Jesus, so that any sins we did could be forgiven and we could spend eternity with you, with your Son, simply by accepting your free gift. As we study today's Old Testament scripture, show us how it applies to our life and most of all, how it teaches us about you and your son. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Okay. In Joshua 2, 3, and 4, Joshua led the children of Israel across the Jordan River and into the promised land. Last week, Joshua 5 through 8, Joshua learned that if he followed God's simple instructions, whether or not he understood the reasons why the instructions were given, Joshua would be successful. And sure enough, Jericho fell into their hands with virtually no injury on their side, a lot on the side of Jericho. Now, Today, we're going to study something which is still telling us about Jesus, but not quite in the way that we have been studying Jesus. Today, we're going to go over a common issue, especially brought up by people who are either new in the faith or have trouble submitting to God. And that's, why is the Old Testament God so mean, cruel, vengeful, and yet the New Testament Jesus, so cuddly, plays with children, so nice, and believe it or not, 
there are many people, maybe not where you have studied scripture, but throughout the world and even in Southern California, there are many people who believe that the Jesus of the New Testament is not the same as the God of the Old Testament. And we're going to read a typical pas pastor passage which explains, which explains how people think this. Okay, what happened? God told Joshua, I will conquer Jericho for you. All you have to do is, is take your marching orders, literally, do what I said, march around the city, and the city, after seven days, will fall without you making one shot of an arrow, not one spear, not one act on your part other than singing worship songs from Maranatha music. Other than that, you're not going to have anything that you have to do. I'm going to knock down the walls of Jericho. Well, Joshua agreed. Joshua did what God said, and Joshua was successful. They conquered Jericho. And God simply gave one expectation. He said, this is the first fruits of our conquering the land. And I want you to learn that your first fruits go to God. Now, a little bit about first fruits going to God. As you know, the idea of a tithe came from the Old Testament. The idea is whatever you make, you give 10% sales tax to God. And of course, the way you do it is to your home church so that your church can afford to put stained glass windows to show everyone how godly the, God, the creator of the universe is. Well, it is a helpful practice to have a guide um, you know, a lot of times, how do we know how much we're supposed to give? Well, the true answer is whatever God tells you to. Whom are we supposed to give to? Whomever God tells you to. Now, of course, if you're a pastor who makes their living by pastoring, thank God I'm not. But if you made your liver, living by being a pastor, you wouldn't like the idea of hearing the people choose where to donate their money. And I don't like the word tithe because that implies 10%, and that is not a New Testament um, idea. It is a New Testament idea that God owns everything you have, and he wants you to use everything for his glory. And he also wants you to show that understanding by the fact that you give the first fruits to God. But it does not specify that you do it to your church or your Bible study. It's who God puts on your heart to give your money to. Because it's his money and he should make that decision. So it might be a missionary in Africa. It might be a ministry right next door to where you live. But... Tithing 10% to your local church, I know I'm going to get feedback on this, but it is not a biblical idea. However, it's very biblical for you to understand and for me to understand that everything we have belongs to God. And the way we remind ourselves of this is that we give our first fruits back to God in the way that he has instructed us to. Okay, well, this is sort of like tithing. God is saying, I'm going to help you conquer many cities, and you are going to get wealthy off of conquering the cities. Is that why I'm letting you conquer them? Far from it. And we'll go on to this in a little while. But that's not why Israel's conquering, because God wants them to get rich. But it is a fact that they will get rich doing that. So God wants them to understand it all belongs to God by taking the first fruits and giving it all to God. So he said, when you conquer Jericho, you don't keep 
one penny. All of it is given to God that you take out of Jericho before you burn it to the ground. Okay. So, next comes the tiny city of Ai. A-I is how we spell it. I is a small city, much easier to defeat than Jericho. And we start at Joshua 7-2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region and by the way, this is where the idea came from. Them being next to Beth Avon and Bethel is, is that when someone knocked at the door, they would say, Beth Avon calling. <laughs> so the men went up and spied out I. When they returned to Joshua, the men said, you know what, not all the people have to go against I. You know, they sent the entire uh, population or army of Israel against Jericho and these guys are saying hey we saw I they're puny you can just send a few people send two or three thousand men don't weary all the people not over such a tiny city as I so about three thousand men went up now do you notice something interesting what did Joshua not do he didn't ask God. His advisors, now this is after a huge victory where they defeated Jericho without lifting a finger. Was that because of their incredible prowess? Was it because of their operatic teaching and they were able to shatter the walls of Jericho by singing a perfect, um, I don't know, what, what, sound, what note did they sing when they shatter glass? Anyone know? High C, thank you. So, um, you sure high C isn't a fruit drink? Okay. Okay, thank you. So anyway, so if I say something and it's funny, look back at Geneva. She will go ahead and, and give the rating on the joke. If it's not funny, don't look. Oh, Leslie will never appreciate it. So... They never asked God. They were so impressed by their own military prowess, even though they did nothing, that they figured that they could easily defeat Ai. Verse, verse 4, when they faced the men of Ai, all they could say was, Ai, 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 Ai. <laughs> so about 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai who chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries. I don't remember how far the stone quarries were from I. And struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and they became like water. Now, they were fearful not because they lost. They were fearful because their biggest military advantage is that the cities of Canaan had heard about the God of Israel, how he won every battle for Israel, and there was no chance of the Canaanites defeating Israel. So when a tiny city like I was able to conquer, uh, defeat Israel, now the neighboring cities will say, oh, their God isn't as powerful as we thought, and these Israelis are not as much to fear as we thought. So the Israelites were very fearful when they lost to Ai. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And he remained there until evening. Now, it would be typical for us if we were to pray before the ark that if in 10 minutes God didn't answer our prayers, well, I guess he's out today. I try tomorrow. All day long he's there, his face in the dust, facing the Ark of the Covenant. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, verse 9, 
The Canaanites will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? Notice how all the great prayers have involved pointing out to God that his name is at question. The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up! What are you doing here on your face? You know, that reminds me of what happened with Moses. Remember, he was scared because the Egyptian army was coming and he starts praying at the water's edge of the Red Sea and, and God said, what are you doing praying? Separate the waters and go through. Oh, I never thought of that. Well, that's what happens with Joshua. He's praying face down in the dust and God said, what are you doing on your face? Stand up. Israel has sinned, God explains, and your praying to me is not going to change the fact that Israel sinned. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. Which part of give me all the wealth of Jericho did you not understand? They took some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them under their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction." So, God is explaining to Israel that the reason they're brave is God put bravery into Israel. And the reason why Israel became frightened, even against a small adversary, and ran. How often can you shoot the enemy or throw a spear accurately if your back is to the enemy and you're running away. But how easy a target is your back when you're running away and they're chasing you? Easy. So what happens? A whole bunch of backs are pierced by spears, but none of the enemy is hurt. God is saying that if he puts fear in the enemy and bravery in Israel, then Israel will not have any problems in the battle. But because Israel had forsaken God, God is not in a position to help Israel. Verse 13, now God is going to tell his game plan. Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, that which is devoted is among you. O Israel, in other words, the stuff I told you to put in the Lord's treasury, it's now in the hands of some of the people. That which is devoted is among you. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. Verse 14, in the morning present yourselves tribe by tribe. That's a lot of people, but each tribe will be presented. Now, it doesn't say if it's the entire tribe, which is unlikely because that's amassing over a million people, or is it simply that representatives of each tribe show up? The tribe the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan, and that clan the Lord shall take family by family, In other words, the Lord is going to identify the person who sinned by taking all the tribes, naming which tribe contains the bad person, and then taking all the clans, naming which clan of that tribe, then which family of that clan, and finally, which house leader of that family. Now, how would God tell them? It doesn't say... Historically, there are two ways in which the God would choose from among people. One is through lots. What would happen is each person would take lots and whoever had the short stick or a colored stick or everyone had white except one who had black, whoever picked the winning and or losing lot was the one chosen by God. Now, we might say, wait a minute, are you going to take harsh action 
based on some backwards people who believe in lots? Well, the answer is, the fact that people hand out lots, does that not mean that guarantees that it's from God? However, if there is someone who is a proven prophet of God, if someone is a proven prophet of God, then if they administer lots, it can be accepted that this is what God is saying. So here's one example where the book of Proverbs tells us that lots, when administered by a prophet, comes from God. And it's Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So here the Old Testament is verifying that when lots are administered by someone of God's choosing, it does describe what God had in mind. When sin was, ex- was suspected in the camp of Israel, for example, when Saul was king, we read in 1 Samuel 14, 41, the lot went all the way from the tribes to the clan, to the family, to the home of Saul himself. And the only males who were there were Saul and his son Jonathan. So one of the two had to be the one guilty of the offense. And it says, Then Saul prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, Give me the right answer. Jonathan and Saul were then taken by Lot, and the men were cleared. In other words, the sin was not from anyone except Jonathan and Saul. And it turns out it was Jonathan who was the one they were looking for. Now, does that mean that any time someone says, oh, I have the power of God, let's pass out lots and see what God wants to do? Well, of course that's not true. But when it's administered by a proven prophet, then it can be accepted as the word of God. That's why God says it is so imperative that when you have someone claiming to be a prophet, you put them through the tests of a prophet. How many... Um, false religions do we have? How many cults do we have because there were prophets or prophetesses who, or prophetic organizations who say, the Lord told me this and no one ever put them through the test of a prophet. So as a result, people accept what they taught as though it is gospel truth, and usually as if it's more important than the Bible. Okay, lots. That is one way they could decide who among these people is the guilty one. The other way that was very common back then was the Urim and the Thummim. The Urim and the Thummim are a pair of eyeglasses that were given to... Wrong, 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 sorry, ignore that. I got my Bibles mixed up. The Urim and the Thummim. We don't know for sure what it is. There are many Old Testament scholars who say that the Urim and the Thummim were special objects, perhaps a stone, perhaps something else, where when a priest who has the gift of Urim and Thummim would hold it? If the answer is yes, it will glow white, and if the answer is no, it will glow dark. And as long as this isn't a charlatan, as long as it's someone who is a proved prophet of God, then this can be accepted as the word of God. Now, Urim and Thummim, the first time it showed up in Scripture, Exodus 28.30, when Moses was instructed that when having the priestly garments made for Aaron, the first high priest, he said, also put the Urim and the Thummim in the breastpiece so they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus, Aaron will always bear the means of making decisions for the Israelites over his heart before the Lord. 
Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who grabs those Urim and Thummim are speaking the word of God, but God has just told Moses, who was a prophet of God, he had just told Moses that Aaron would be able to interpret the Urim and the Thummim and that God would help Aaron make decisions using that. Finally, Urim and Thummim were very vital after captivity ended. Do you remember that many years from when we're studying, but in the time of Daniel, in the time of Jeremiah, in the time of Ezekiel, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem and took slaves all the way back to Babylon where Israel remained in captivity for 70 years. You remember that? Okay, we'll do a review in about two years when we get there. So, there were many people after 70 years of captivity who said, my great-grandfather was a priest, and therefore I'm going to be a priest now the captivity is over and we're back in the promised land. What the leaders said, and this includes Nehemiah and it includes Ezra, what they said is, Ezra 2.63, the governor ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food. In other words, do not take on the privileges or the requirements of a priest until there is a priest ministering with Urim and Thummim. In other words, they had to find a priest who could prove his prophetic license and who could read Urim and Thummim and always turn out to be right. Like he would say, there will be a lightning storm in 21 days. Or if people say, when is the next lightning storm? He says, will it be one day? White. Will it be two days? White. Will it be three days? White. And then you hit 21 days, and all of a sudden it turns black. Or maybe the other way around. And he says, 21 days, there will be a lightning storm. Then they wait 21 days. If there isn't a lightning storm, they stone him to death. He's a false prophet. If there is a lightning storm, then he has proved himself that he has the Urim and the Thummim gift of interpretation. And they should not take anyone in as a priest since they don't have any records to base it on unless someone authenticates the priesthood by using the Urim and the Thummim. Okay. So, whether it's casting lots or whether it's Urim and Thummim, either way, Joshua has all of Israel tested until it's narrowed down to one tent. And that is the tent of Achan. And then they go through each person to see who is guilty and then Joshua goes up to Achan and says, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder and the spoils, a beautiful robe from Babylonian, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and I took them. They're hidden in the ground beside my tent and the silver underneath. And by the way, notice how he tries, Achan tries to deflect what he did wrong. You know, a lot of people when they sin, they say, well, he did it too. They try to take some of the blame away. Well, Achan said, well, I took some of the plunder. Was this plunder? See, plunder is what you get as a result of conquering someone. You take all their goods. That's what plunder is. Did God say, give me plunder? No. He said, give me first fruits to remind you that all good things come from me. But Achan here is making it sound as though God wants the plunder and I wanted it too. 
It's not quite the same thing. When I saw the plunder, I coveted them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent. And there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver underneath. They took the things of the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his sons and daughters, to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. That's a little pun because his name means trouble. So I, the Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they stoned the rest and burned them. Ooh, is that kind of harsh? First of all, the death sentence for Achan, but also for his family, for his sons and daughters, That's, and the pet turtle too. Over Achan, they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, the place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. There are many suggested reasons why God would punish the sons and daughters of Achan by executing them by stoning when it was their father Achan who committed the crime. The most common one I read is that People always suffer as a result of your and my sin. So it's no surprise, and we should always be reminded, that when we sin, our offspring will suffer as a result. I don't buy that in the slightest. That really doesn't sound like the God I know. But what is the reason? I don't think we'll have time to go over that today. Verse 20, uh, verse, I'm sorry, Joshua chapter 8. Then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up, attack I, for I have delivered into your hands the land. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. Bottom line, God gives them a strategy. And it sounds like pretty good strategy, but, you know, I'm not into military tactics at all. But in the strategy, Joshua was to take his best fighting men and hide them fairly close to the city of Ai. This will be at night. Then during the day, the army will attack in full view. I will be very confident because they... they thwarted Israel last time and when they come out and start attacking Israel will pretend to be frightened then they'll run away and I will say look we did it again and they'll chase them chase them chase them chase them until the city is left without defense then Joshua's top soldiers will enter into the city that has no defense. They'll easily capture it and then burn it down. When the army of Ai turns around and sees a fire and says, were they going to do a barbecue for us when we won this battle? And then they realize that their city is on in flames, that they have nowhere to go. And then the soldiers who had been hiding leave the city and come towards them so they are sandwiched between the two armies. Then they panic and then Israel routs them. That's what God said to do. Now question, does it sound like it was a good plan? Sure it does. Is that why it worked? No. I'll bet you there were some good plans that still wouldn't work. And God just knows the beginning from the end. I bet there are some plans that are pretty good, 
But God knows they will work for sure. So, I don't think the issue is how good the plan was. The issue is God knew the enemy, their hearts, and most of all, the future. And he knows what's going to work and what won't work. And we're going to see over the next cup, uh, the next. 1400 years or so we're going to see that Israel again and again will receive advice from God on how to conduct a military campaign and when they do it God's way they win and this is just more military tactics Promotions afterwards, party at the officers club. Okay, question, what does this teach us about Jesus? Well, we've already gone through, and it's still true now, Jacob's Hebrew name, the name that whenever we read Joshua in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that was translated as Joshua is Yehoshua, which means God is salvation. Yehoshua. There's one other person in the Bible whose Hebrew name is Yehoshua. You remember who that is? Jesus. Jesus' name was Yehoshua, just like Joshua's name was Yehoshua. And the shortened name of Jesus was Yeshua, and the shortened name of Joshua is Yeshua. So it's very safe to start with, in a story, does Joshua represent Jesus? Well, what did Joshua do? God told Joshua, go into battle against Ai. And he said, this time, do it this way. So Joshua did it the way the Lord said. And what happened? They won. Not only that, God told Joshua to execute Achan and to execute all those in his tent. And Joshua did. Well, if we assume that Joshua is Jesus, then what we're saying is that, the, is that God will tell Jesus, this is what you are to do, this is my plan, and Jesus always obeys God. Many people will start with the big question. Since when is Jesus of the New Testament killing people? Since when is he leading huge armies to destroy other armies? That's the God of the Old Testament, not the God of the New Testament. Untrue. Let me tell you a little bit about the Jesus of the New Testament. Let's read Revelation 17, 14 in your handouts. They will make war against the Lamb. And this is right at the second coming. But the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Anyone have a wild guess when it's referring to someone who is called the Lamb and is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, whom is it referring to? Amen. So, the Lamb will overcome because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with him will be his called, his chosen, his faithful followers. What do you call people in the New Testament who are faithful followers of Jesus? Christians. So, if someone ever asks you, wait a minute, where does it say in Scripture that at the second coming, the Christians will follow the Lord down to the earth? Your answer is Revelation 17, 14. Other places too, but that's my favorite. Now, when they go to battle against the leaders of the world at the second coming, do you think it gets really ugly I'm going to guess yes. Let's look at Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven standing open, 
And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. Now some people argue that this rider, the white horse, in Revelation 19, not elsewhere necessarily, but in Revelation 19, some argue it isn't necessarily Jesus. Well, let's go ahead five verses and see if you think it's Jesus. On his robe and on his thigh, his name is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. How many people do you know whose name is King of kings and Lord of lords? So, is it safe to say the rider of the white horse in Revelation 19, who is called faithful and true, who judges and makes war, is it fair to say that's Jesus? Is that a no-brainer? Okay, so let's move on. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed, a lot of people say that proves it isn't Jesus. Why? Because he has a special name that no one else knows? That doesn't mean it isn't Jesus. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Does it sound like that battle's going to get messy? And his name is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, now the armies of heaven are not us. It's the angels. So who accompanies Jesus? Us, the church, and the armies of heaven. Do the so-called tribulation saints join? No, they haven't received their bodies yet. And God doesn't want people without bodies fighting battles with him. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with an iron scepter. He treads the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Does it sound like it's going to be messy to you? I saw an angel who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in the sky. The birds? Why are they being invited to the battle? Come, gather together, for great is the supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, mighty men, horses, riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Now, the battle hasn't happened yet, but the Lord is on his way with the church, with the angels, and... One of the angels calls out to the birds, hey, get ready, be close, get the first pickings because you're going to get to eat a lot of flesh. Are we talking about a Sunday school Jesus who never raises his voice? Now, don't get me wrong, at the first coming, it was prophesied that Jesus would be very gentle bringing salvation. That's true. But nowhere does it say he would be gentle when he faced the Antichrist armies and the people who have hurt his people and the people who interfered with the plan of God. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider of the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs. The two of them were given a time out and told never to do that again. The two of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire. Wow. Now, I have never been thrown alive into the lake of fire. I'm guessing it's not fun. The rest of the army was killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider of the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. I want you to picture an enormous percent of the world population slain and birds eating out their eyes and their face and whatever was exposed on the battlefield. Question. Is it the New Testament Jesus who believes in being kind and nice, a 
and never raising his voice. But the Old Testament one destroyed the population of Jericho and then destroyed the population of the city of Ai. Well, obviously it's going to happen again and far more deaths when the second coming of Christ, he destroys the army of the Antichrist. It will be bloody. There will be so much blood that how high does it go on the horses? Say it louder. The bridle up to the bridle of the horse. I assume that's high up. That's a lot of blood. Now, how can a God of righteousness do that? How many times have you heard people say, how could a God of love allow a child to get leukemia? How could a God of love allow a rapist to kill this person in cold blood, to kidnap a little child? How could a God of love allow that? Well, the question implies that we want God to take matters into his own, own hand, which he can do, he created us, but we want God to take matters into his own hand and destroy the evil which leads to people killing people, that leads to disease, that leads to rape, that leads to kidnapping of children. Doesn't that imply that to you when you say, how could God allow it? What you're saying is God shouldn't allow it. Well, now God has a plan so that all of that will be gone. There will be no rape in the future during the millennial kingdom. There will be no risk of children being hurt in the millennial kingdom. You won't have children left and right going to City of Hope for chemotherapy for their cancer. It's something that won't happen anymore. You know, we read during the millennial kingdom that children will be able to wander around and the main problem if they put their hand into a cobra nest is that their hands will be dirty for lunchtime. The main problem if they're allowed to play with wild lions is that they'll probably grab the mane too hard and the lion will whimper. We're talking about a perfect world where all these things, how could a God of love allow this, no longer occurs. God has shown us his solution. And part of that solution is ridding the population of those who will prevent the solution from happening. Well, couldn't God come up with a way other than killing? You know, God looks at death a little differently than we do. You know, godly people have a tendency to die ungodly people have a tendency to die. Have you ever noticed that? So when you say, but God allowed an entire city to die, do you think that if this didn't happen, there would be survivors of the city of Ai or Jericho today? Do you think they'd be alive today? The issue of who dies may seem like a lot to us. Why? Because we've never known anything but life. So death is an end to everything that we know. But to God, we all die. The main issue is not who dies, because we all do. The main issue is what happens to our eternity. Are there people who lived in Israel when they conquered Jerusalem who still didn't go to heaven because they didn't have a right walk with God. Sure there were. Are there people who did die in battle and who did have a good walk with God and are not in hell now? Absolutely, yes. You know, Jonathan died in battle. I would imagine that Jonathan is in heaven today. I don't know that, but I would imagine... So when we think about how terrible God is because he wiped out a city, they were all going to die anyway. But what God 
cares about is ridding the world of this evil that causes people to be raped, murdered, kidnapped, all sorts of horrible things. And if some people die in this world as a result, they would have died anyway. And the issue is their eternity, not when they died. One other question, though. What about Aiken's family? Capital punishment is still hard for a lot of us, but killing his children? Wasn't this a contradiction of God's own law that he gave Moses? Yeah. Law of Moses, Deuteronomy 24, 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. What does that mean? If your father steals from God, you don't get executed as a result. Now, there are many people who say, who will attack what God does, but they do believe in executing children for the sins of the father. Let me give you one very uncomfortable example. Let's say a man is a murderer and a rapist. And let's say he rapes a pregnant woman and in such a way that the child... I'm sorry, let's say this again. You know how when you say, I oppose abortion, and then someone will say, well, what about for rape or incest? Which you know that's a garbage argument because what percent of abortions are performed because of rape and incest? I'm not saying it never happens, but people who use that as an argument, they're full of it. That's not their real point. The real point is they don't want to stop abortion in any way. But let's look at their argument. Should you allow abortion when a woman is pregnant from rape, which as I said is very rare that that will happen, but it does happen on rare occasions. So, should you execute the child because the father of the child is guilty of rape? It says right here, fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. And yet, it is the law of the land right now that if a father sins by raping a woman and she gets pregnant, that his son can be executed through abortion. However, is the father executed? No. As a matter of fact, it's amazing how many safeguards that father has, but not his innocent child. But let's go back to Achan. What about his children? Are they being killed for the sins of the father? No. Why were they killed? Because of their own sin. Where do they live? In the tent. Where was Achan's loot? In the tent. Did the children know that the loot was in the tent? Yes, that's why they were executed. Now, aren't children beneath the age of accountability? Depends how old they are. In Hebrew, sons and daughters does not necessarily mean children. Just like in our language, it doesn't mean that. I had a father... When I was in my 50s, I had a mother when I was in my 50s. That would mean their son was 50-ish years old. Aiken's children were not little children. They were probably somewhere around 25, 30 years old. And they knew what Aiken had done, and they allowed it. And that was a sin punishable by death. 
By the way, do you think the children understood the law? Let me read you Joshua 8.33. All alien, all Israel, aliens and citizens alike were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant facing those who carried it. Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, just as it was written in the book of the law. There was not one word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the entire assembly of Israel, including women and children and aliens who lived among them. And back in Deuteronomy 31, Moses had told them, Assemble the people, the men and the women, the children and the alien who is in your towns that they may hear and listen and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of the Lord, all the men, all the women, all the children. Did they know that if you observe a sin against God and do nothing to rectify it, you are guilty of the same sin? Rushing Flow Bible Study, taught by Bible teacher Dr. Walter Bramson, separating the truth of God's word from the traditions so of men. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Son of God. Praise the Lamb who took away our sin and died for us. This is the Threshing Floor Bible Study with Dr. Walter Bramson. For more information, please see our website at drwalterbramson.com. So we never die. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Son of God.